chances are, if you're sitting at home in the United States right now, you're probably thinking to yourself, I want to find a way to see more of the world, explore more of the world. And some of us are deciding not even just to do it in a short term way. Many of us are deciding that we want to not just leave the United States for a couple of vacations, but do so in a long term, indefinite manner where you really kind of embed yourself in the culture. You learn the language, you make friendships, you have relationships that you date, you all these things that, that go on when you really sort of embed yourself in a culture in a long term way, when you really fully extract a value out of a place that you can't get in just these short term stays. For example, I am here staying in Colombia. I've spent just about half of my time here over the past two years, and I've been traveling on the road for pretty much like nonstop for the past three or four years. And in this video today, if you're sitting at home in the United States and you're thinking, how is it that I can not just leave the United States, but do so in a maybe a longer term fashion? That's what I'm going to try to break down in this video. So let's get right into the video. So I'm figuring out how it is that you can leave the United States or the West or whatever it is that you come from in a long term manner. There are two problems that I see have to fundamentally be solved. The first one is obviously money. You need to find a way to support yourself and sustain yourself, but not just make money, but to do so in a manner that is location independent, meaning you don't have to be in the United States. You don't have to be in the UK or whatever it is that you are to be working on this job. You can be living in any country in the world, hypothetically, as long as you ideally have an internet connection. Now, the second main problem that I see is location. Now, it's going to depend a little more on you, what it is that you're looking for, what your preferences are, but I do believe that there are some places that are just inherently better than others for being sort of a traveler, digital nomad type of person. And now there's a million people online that are trying to sell you courses on how to make money online. And I'm not going to be the next guy who does that. I'm going to be going over a conceptual framework for how to think about looking for opportunities to make money online that can apply to pretty much any domain that you decide to choose, not just this, this one little area that I'm trying to sell a course on. Knowledge. And I would start off with two book recommendations that I think everybody has to read if they're going to be trying to live this, like I said, the digital nomad lifestyle. The first one, obviously everyone knows that the four hour work week is the Bible of the digital nomads. Like no one can do anything like this and not read the four hour work week. Like you just, you can't. The second book that I'd recommend, I think it's a little bit lesser known than the four hour work week is Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Now Anti-Fragile is a book that is not necessarily entirely just about making money or about travel. It is a it is a book that really kind of breaks down like frameworks and understanding just for living life in general. Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb or Anti-Fragile Things That Gain From Disorder is a book where Nassim Taleb really kind of breaks down several concepts to understand how it is that we can thrive in a world where there is chaos. And when you're traveling on the road and also when you're trying to make money online. These are two environments where there's a lot of chaos. And it is an incredible book that I really think everyone has to read if they want to live a life where they have options. You have to understand how it is that I can move in a prosperous way, not just in one environment, but across all environments. And the main concept that he uses in this book to articulate that point is, is a term called optionality. Now options are commonly known as a financial tool. It is something that has a limited and known downside with potentially an infinite upside. It is allowing you to leverage the potentiality of something. And optionality is gonna be the framework that you're gonna to wanna to be using when you're figuring out what opportunities you wanna look for when making money online. And a way to illustrate this concept is that it really applies to every single area of life. When it comes to something as simple as like dating, a lot of guys, they have a lot of stress and fear about doing, but that is a perfect example of optionality. When you go up and talk to someone, it has a known limited downside. The time that you waste when you go up and you approach a girl that you think is really pretty, that you think is really beautiful, the worst case scenario is that you feel bad, you get rejected, it doesn't feel that great, and you waste a little bit of like the, the 30 seconds or whatever that it took you to make the approach. That is like the absolute worst case scenario. The best case scenario on the upside, maybe you talk to that girl, maybe you get her number, maybe you go on a date with her, maybe you start hooking up with her, maybe you date her, she becomes your girlfriend, and she becomes your wife, and you have kids, and you have a family, and you grow old together. Like the upside is potentially unlimited. Like the downside is known. So I bring up this point to illustrate how optionality is something that you can see in all areas of your environment, not just in making money. One business that I've been involved with for a while is I've had an apparel brand online, that I've had a merch brand online online and one of the reasons why you see all these creators like have their own merch it's not because like they're in the back and they're like actually like you know doing the hard labor printing out their own t-shirts merch is an industry that is almost entirely automated meaning all people do is that when they go to your website and they click on buy the person that owns the right to that shirt they're not doing anything that that shirt gets made by a different company and that different company sends it to the customer and through the entire process the, the person who, who made the shirts that they don't see the shirt whatsoever so what does that mean like if you spend almost little to no time having to make the product or ship the product product. That means the only time that you really spend is making the design. You can sell an infinite number of designs, an infinite number of shirts. There's nothing limiting you. There's no inventory cap on what shirts you can make because these shirts are made per order. So that means you can like really scale this in a, in a, in a rather uh, hypothetically infinite way. 
So all I have to do is just sit down and make t-shirt design, t-shirt design, t-shirt design, t-shirt design. And it's something that, like I said, optionality, it has a limited to known downside. The worst case scenario when I create a product online, when I create a t-shirt design, is that I lose the time that I spent making it. But whatever the case is, that design is on there forever. So in this case, in t-shirts, I don't even spend money until I actually sell a shirt. And maybe I spend money on marketing it, but that's a whole different domain of optionality as well. The limited downside is just the amount of time that I spend making it. If you use a service like Printful, you can literally just sell potentially infinitely. If I make a t-shirt design and only sells $1 a week for the rest of my life, I'm still getting paid a pretty good rate per hour for maybe the one or two hours that I spent on making that design. And optionality is not something that just has to apply to selling a product online, but it also can apply if you're marketing your services. And even if you're marketing your service online, you're sending cold emails, you're trying to get clients, each email that you send, each outreach attempt that you send is basically kind of the same thing that I said in the example of dating. You go up, you approach a girl, you introduce yourself, like say, hey, this is me, you know. It's the exact same scenario, but with freelancing, maybe you talk to that client a little more, maybe you go back and forth, maybe they tell you what they're looking for, they try to figure out more about you, and then maybe they hire you full time and you're on payroll for, for months and months and months or maybe even years. And all that comes just from exercising the initial option of having the known limited downside of spending maybe a few minutes writing up an email and sending it to a client. And and having the potentially unlimited upside of getting a client that's gonna pay you forever. And an important thing to remember with optionality is that, like I said, there's a known limited downside. Like you can't get negative results. Like with YouTube videos that I'm making, for example, I can't get negative views. I can get maybe a dislike, but YouTube doesn't even like really weigh that too heavily in the algorithm whether the video has a lot of likes or dislikes. But it is impossible for me to get negative one view or negative five views. Every single view is positive. And that's what makes the, the concept of options so powerful. And that's how it generally I think applies to a lot of these different domains in online because online things have the potentiality to go viral. I made a little like five second YouTube short clip. I didn't really put that much work into it whatsoever, but one night I was sitting on my YouTube analytics and I just saw the chart just going like boom, just like straight up. And it got like a thousand something views, I don't know. But within the span of just a couple minutes, I have no idea why. It's just for some reason, YouTube algorithm decided to bless that, that one piece of content for that day. And that's the second part of this process of making things that have a very limited to known downside. And then as a result of doing that enough times, you make enough t-shirts, you send enough emails, you sell enough product, eventually you're gonna get information. And what you should do is you should aim for the smallest result possible and try to learn from that. Whether it's one view, whether it's one purchase, whether it's one whatever, whatever it is, aim for the smallest result possible. And then ask yourself, what happened there? The first time I ever sold anything online, I remember exactly where I was. And I remember looking at my phone and seeing a notification that I had from Etsy that I had just got a sale for $5. And I remember thinking like when I got that notification, like there was two parts of me, there was like two sides of me that was like split. And I remember thinking like, okay, that's a fluke because I had been wanting to make money online. I was trying everything. And one thing I tried was, was putting out digital downloads. And this person had just purchased a $5 digital download on Etsy, which is basically someone paying $5 for a JPEG. And mind you, this is way before NFTs or anything like that. And I remember exactly where I was, where I was standing. I was standing in the doorway of the bathroom in the apartment of the girlfriend that I had at the time. And I remember looking down at my phone and seeing the notification that I had just got a sale for $5. And I remember a part of me was thinking, like I remember observing these two parts of myself that were very split. There was one part of me that was saying like, oh, that's interesting, that's kind of weird. That's like, I was kind of blowing off like a little bit of a fluke, like, oh, that's, what a coincidence. But then another part of me was like, wait a second, if I can do this once, I can do it again. And if I can do it again, I can do it again and again and again and again and again. Review the process, look at the analytics, look at the result, learn from it, and make it better. Each time I do it again, make it a little bit better. And each time I do it again and I make it better, I'm gonna get better information from that test. And so that is kind of the basic overall feedback loop that you're searching. You're testing, you're getting results, and then you're getting better feedback and you're getting better results. You start to test and put yourself out there enough times and information is gonna be coming back to you. This is like a mirror. And I feel that once you really start putting stuff out there and you start getting a body of information through your analytics, through seeing how many visitors you got, your sales, or people just responding to you by email, all that is information. And in my opinion, that's like knowing the hive mind or something like that, when you can see the analytics and sort of read between the numbers and see what exactly is going on. You do it enough times, you put yourself out there enough times, and it becomes a mirror that reflects back at you and tells you exactly what you need to do to improve. With this YouTube channel, for instance, I had put out a video, I put it out there and I wasn't getting that many views, but I had a pretty good of average watch time that people were watching the videos for. And I was trying to think like, okay, like my, my, my click-through rate is very low. My click-through rate was like under 10%. And 
I decided, well, let me just take, tinker around. And I changed the thumbnail of the video and all of a sudden, I don't know why, it shot up to like 13% click-through rate. So it became this thing, it became this feedback loop and now you know, oh, okay, well like that type of thumbnail maybe doesn't work as much, this type of thumbnail works better. And it's like, I don't really do anything. Right? It just tells me the business, your, your, your freelancing clients, your YouTube channel, whatever it is, after a while, it begins to tell you what it is that you need to do to improve by looking at the, by reviewing the analytics and looking at the numbers and everything like that. So it becomes a thing like you don't even really have to worry about it too much because if you just pay attention to it, you're gonna get better. Another example is I just posted a YouTube poll the other day where I said, what kind of content do you guys wanna see more of? And I think I posted four things. I said, do you wanna see more vlogs? Do you wanna see more useful content? Do you wanna see me like make more like kind of philosophical essays? Or do you wanna see just anything with girls? And the funny thing is, is like it was pretty split three ways, but the one that didn't get any votes whatsoever was philosophical essays, which was a clear sign to me like, okay, I'm, pro I'm pontificating a little bit too much. I need to be focusing on providing useful content or according to my subscribers, I need to be doing vlogs with pretty girls while providing useful content. Like that, that's, that, that I guess is the perfect recipe. But that's an example of like, now I have this thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's regurgitating back to me what exactly it is that I need to do. And that's the beautiful process of, of, of pursuing this. Whew. And so I've talked enough about making money online. If you want me to make a, another video going like fully in depth uh, into this topic, then leave a comment down below and let me know. Like this video, hit subscribe. And uh, I, I appreciate you watching this video. That's all I have to say. That's, that's thank you. I like that. Uh, much love guys. And uh, I'll see you next time. Peace.